Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before we get into tonight's virtual event with Rachel Halzel Hall and Jess Lowry, I just wanted to make a couple of general store announcement stuff so you guys could know what is going on. I'm sure you might know we were scheduled to have a couple of in-store events on the calendar for September. Unfortunately, we have canceled all of those um, Miranda James, aka Dean James, was supposed to be uh, signing at the store on Saturday, so we rescheduled him for the previous Tuesday. So if you missed his event Tuesday night, you can check that out on the store's Facebook and YouTube channel. Um, next week, uh, David Liss, uh, we've moved him virtual. He's going to be next Tuesday night at 7 in conversation with Ann Perry. Uh, Wednesday night, I'll be chatting with Lisa Jewell uh, virtually at 7. And then the only one that we haven't actually gotten rescheduled quite yet is William Kent Kruger. We've gotten our signed copies of his books, but we're just uh, trying to figure out a date that will work for him. So hopefully in the next week or so we'll have a new date for Kent. Uh, the store is open. We hope that you will come visit us. Uh, we are requiring masks in the store with the surge in Delta variant cases and the ICU situation in Houston. So hope that you will mask up when you come visit us. Uh, if you were not getting out about in the world and you're doing curbside pickup, just give us a call when you pull into the parking lot and we are happy to run stuff out to the uh, car for you. Uh, we are going to be sending out a newsletter tomorrow about our uh, Labor Day sale. Uh, but uh, just a sneak peek, we're going to be doing all in-store signed books and some select puzzles are going to be 20% off. So definitely check back for that. And then tomorrow, Tomorrow night at seven, we're super excited. McKenna is going to be back here chatting with um, Nancy Springer, who writes the Enola Holmes books. We're huge fans of that series, and this is the first uh, book in the series in 10 years. So McKenna is going to be back tonight to see, uh, or tomorrow night, I'm sorry, she'll be here tomorrow night at seven to chat with her. But tonight, I'm so excited for us to be able to host an event for These Toxic Things by Rachel Halzel Hall. Um, after I finished it, I absolutely loved it. I emailed the publicist and said, hey, we really want to get something set up with Rachel. And we're really excited to have Jess Lowry here with us as well. So I'm going to bring them on and get us started. I'm going to start with Jess. How are you tonight, Jess? I'm doing well, John. Thank you for having me. How are hey, you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for doing this for us. My pleasure. So to get Jess officially introduced, Jess Lowry is the best-selling author of Bloodline, Unspeakable Things, the Catalan uh, Book of Secrets and the, the Salem's Cipher Thrillers and the Mira James Mysteries, among many other works, including young adult short stories and nonfiction. An Edgar, Agatha, Anthony, and Lefty nominee, Jess is a tenured professor of creative writing and sociology and a leader of writing retreats. She is also a recipient of the Lost Excellence in Teaching Fellowship, a Psychology Today blogger, and a TED Talk presenter. Check out her TED Talks uh, for the inspiration behind her first published novel. When she's not leading writing workshops, reading, or spending time with her friends and family, you can find her working on her next story. And she also just won the Anthony Award for Best Paperback Original for Unspeakable Things. Congratulations. Thank you. It was, uh, yeah, I was blown away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And so she's going to be leading the chat for us this evening with Rachel. So let's bring Rachel out. How are you tonight, Rachel? I'm fine. I'm just smiling as you're reading Jess's bona fides. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. But thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm, I'm so I'm so glad we got to do this. You know, the, the one time that you came to the store and, you know, we had we had a tiny little crowd, but you and me and Sam and the people that got to to hang out just got to like chat and get to know each other. So I'm so excited that we get to do this virtual event. I feel the same. So, yeah, I look forward to getting back down there in real life. Yeah, definitely. We we are. Uh, it was it was a rough morale day the week the, that day that we canceled all of our in store events for September. Um, yeah. And we're 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 excited to be able to do this virtual stuff and connect people that we wouldn't necessarily get to see in store. But we definitely miss that kind of getting to see everybody and hug everyone's yeah. when they come to visit. So, well, I'm glad to be here. So as we mentioned, um, Rachel's newest book, These Toxic Things, just came out yesterday. Uh, so Rachel mm -hmm. Hall is the author of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and Lefty Award nominated, and now she's gone, and the Anthony Award, Lefty, Lefty Award, and International Thriller Writer Award nominated, They All Fall Down. She also writes the acclaimed Detective Eloise uh, Norton series, including The Land of Shadows, Skies of Ash, Trail of Echoes, and City of Saviors. Rachel is also the co-author of The Good Sister with James Patterson, which was included in the New York Times bestseller, The Family Lawyer, and she lives in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna get this turned over to Jess, but while they are chatting this evening, if you guys have questions for either author, please post those in the live chat on uh, YouTube and the comments on Facebook, and we will get to them in a bit. If you want more information about the authors or to order copies of their books, I have dropped links to the event page that's got their books on there as well. So Jess, I'm gonna turn this over to you and I will see you guys in just a little bit. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rachel. I'm so excited to see you. 
I'm so excited to see you, my friend. I miss you. I miss you too. If the world was a fair place, we were going to have martinis next week in Minneapolis. Yes, yes, we yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, no, but next time there's always 2023. No, 2022. I totally skipped over 2022. It's not a wash. It's not a wash, fate. <laughs> no, yeah, don't skip over it. So you're yeah. going to come to Minneapolis for BoucherCon 2022? Yes, I will definitely be there. Yes, yeah. excellent. So I posted on social media that I'm going to fangirl over you, and that's the next 45 minutes. I'm just gonna, <laughs> you are one of my favorite writers. And so we're going to talk about these toxic things in a bit, but I found out about you through Lou, Eloise Lou Norton, your yes. yeah, and specifically The Land of Shadows. Mm -hmm. um, I loved that series so much. Yeah. And if I had known we were going to be friends, I would have a better origin story of who put that book in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just one of those books. I got it, I read it, and I could not put it down. Um, oh, you've been you. compared to Raymond Chandler, uh, your writing, in that, and specifically in that series. Um, and that's fine, right? That's fine. Yes. <laughs> that's Raymond Chandler. <laughs> you know, but I think you are your, your own... You do something, and this is why I'm your biggest fan, girl. You do something better than anybody I know, which is you combine lyrical language and cinematic setting that just shoots me into the story. Um, yeah. Everything you, everything you write. Um, but I was hoping you'd read a little bit from Land of Shadows to give us an example. Yes, I will, and thank you. Oh, I'm a fan girl too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I'm gonna read um from Land of Shadows in the third chapter, and this is when Lou, who is an Angelino like me, is surveying the crime scene where uh, that, that kicks off this novel. The condo was near move-in condition, only needing appliances, carpet, and face plates for the electrical outlets, but you could check out buzz of a thousand blowflies off that list because this condo had plenty of buzz. 10 steps from the front door through the tiny living room was the patio. In the view from that patio, the Sears at the mall across the street, some view for $400,000. You look over here and I'll look over there, I instructed. She's talking to her partner, Colin. A rookie detective, Colin shone his light at the ceiling. Hope floats, I said, but blood and bone drop. Puzzled, he scrunched his eyebrows. What? I pointed to the concrete ground. Scan down here too, Columbo, because there's this thing called gravity. He blinked at me. Oh yeah, of course. I shone my flashlight on the tiny foyer's ground. No skid marks, no blood. In the living room, the size of a decent walk-in closet, I crouched on the balls of my feet and peered closer. Some parts of the concrete appear cleaner than other parts, darker, like had been recently wiped down. I directed a beam of light at the white floorboards, a place blood splatter could land, clean. At the entry to the master bedroom, I looked up, I looked down, I looked everywhere, no blood. In the middle of the room, I crouched into a catcher stance again and scrutinized the concrete walls and floor. Nothing strange, well, except for the intense drone of those flies. I drew closer to the bedroom and the buzzing intensified. As I stepped across the threshold, dread filled the pit of my stomach. I took a step and then another toward that closed closet door. As I reached out to touch the doorknob, I muttered a quick prayer. Please help me to see. Oh my God. I could have you read to me all night long. <laughs> so there's so there's four Lou books. Are there yes. and I hate when people ask this question of writers, but are there gonna be more? I'm gonna ask you, are there gonna be more Lou books? I don't know. I hope so. I hope um one day to be popular enough that you know my publisher demands it and I say, okay, I'll do it. But until then, no, she continues to live in my mind, though. And, you know, sh she, in my head and in my imaginations, is a college friend and a homegirl that, you know, grew up in the apartment across from me. So she's still alive for me. Um, just uh, we're just on separation right now. So yeah. we will find we'll find each other again. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. love it. I love that idea of her as a friend because her voice, she's hilarious, right? I love her, yeah. Right, she's not only a detective, it's not only gritty and physical, but she's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to write characters, and I try to do this with, with each story, um, these fully realized women who are like 
us who we're strong, we're weak in some ways, we crack up in the, at the wrong times of the day, we are wrinkled, you know, we're, we sweat and we love maybe for the worse, maybe for the best. Um, you use a term called was band once. Yeah, was band. <laughs> and you know, some of us has have was bands and <laughs> we don't know how to feel about that. So I want to capture all that in the women that that I write. And Lou, she helped me get there. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 been a it every every story I write, I get to explore who I am, who the women that I've known, uh, my own daughter who's growing up before my eyes and taking all those qualities and putting them into um, these new characters, which is why I probably love standalones right now because yeah. I get to infuse those qualities into new women, every every story. Yeah, your women are complex without it making, without it like you're trying, right? It's just like, these are women I know. Yeah, and yeah in extra big situations, but they're very relatable. Right, right. No, I, we. you don't have to make, for me, you don't have to make them extraordinary because just watching a woman at say a grocery store is drama because you don't know, you know, she may have a kid on her arm, her husband may be with her and just annoying the hell out of her because he doesn't come to the store, you know, I saw a fight, well, an argument in the store over a mop during the heyday of the pandemic. And it wasn't like this big brawling thing, but just sniping and just sitting and watching, you know, just watching that interaction to me is fascinating. And so, you know, like all of us writers were vampires. You take that energy and you take those moments and you store it in your mind file cabinet. And when it's time, you're like, ha. I'm gonna put that woman who was fighting about the mop at Ralph's and she's <laughs> gonna be somehow in the story. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I was at the grocery store, this was a few years ago, and I was behind this couple who was probably in their 90s, no lie, and he was putting things on the conveyor belt, apparently wrong, and, <laughs> and she turned to him and she said, you know what, Harold, you are as sharp as a marble. And, <laughs> and she said it in the nicest voice that it took me a second to, <laughs> put it together but how how but that's a, that's interesting how do you put things wrong on the conveyor belt i i mean after after 90 years apparently you can still do it wrong i guess so <laughs> but that's to me that's fascinating to you that's obviously fascinating and yeah. i'm sure you know that's going to be a scene somehow in one book you know next year or years down down the way so yeah, yeah. Yeah, speaking of inspiration, speaking of the way that those ideas come to us, I think it's a little bit different for most writers. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I'll get an idea from a dream or a, a, something on the news, and then I sort of put it out there, and things either stick to it and it takes shape, or it doesn't have legs and I can't use it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you what? Did, how do you get inspiration? And specific to these toxic things, how did you come up with that completely original plot? Well, I wanted to. So writers, we're, we, we are thieves and we are collectors ourselves. And one way that we do that is we read a lot of books and we read books forensically to learn how they did that trick. Like magicians, you know, you go to see a magic show and they're magicians, you know, they're sitting there and like, how did they do that wondrous thing? And I read a book a long time ago, I think it's called The Geographer's Library, who did this trick with um, cataloging things that the author was talking about. And I'm like, I love that. It really didn't add much to the four motion of the story, but I still like that little trick. So I kept it in my mind. It's lived in my mind probably for 16, 17 years. Um, so that was one part. Another part was, you know, I'm as, as I get older, um, family secrets are becoming uh, exposed and we're talking more and, you know, you're learning things that you didn't know. And so that is inspirational, but it's also troubling because yes. you think you know some things and you have no idea. Um, over the pandemic, you know, like everybody, I was cleaning out a lot of closets and 
I've come across like my daughter's thing. She's 17 now, but her baby book, her baby box with her swim caps and her te little baby teeth and, you know, that special dress I got her for her christening. And, you know, you, you, you're fascinated by that stuff. And, you know, someone could look at that cap, that swim cap. She could look at that sw swim cap. And I'm thinking that was a wonderful thing. And she's like, I hated swim class. You know, yeah. she doesn't, but you know, yeah. you, something as easy as, you know, a swim cap could produce two totally different reactions. And I find that fascinating as I'm watching her, you know, grow up. So I wanted to capture memories and how wonderfully toxic they can be for everyone involved. And I wanted it combined with a serial killer story because I am a crime novelist yeah. and how this young woman who's protected like so many of our girls are, um, and despite the protection, are still vulnerable. And how the love of family can protect you from some things, but ultimately they may not. So I, I look to my family. I look to um, what's happening in the world because crime, and that's always happening. And I look to things that I've read that you know I think are great tricks. I like tricks. I like earning those twists. So I don't want to just do a twist for the hell of a twist because, you know, that's what's expected. No, I want to earn it. And I earn it by studying how jacked up families can be. You don't need to like do cheap things when, you know, real life is screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, why fake it? That's <laughs> over there <laughs> right just, i didn't know that just open the family closet there's a whole exactly. in there. <laughs> what do you mean that's not my daddy i have his eyes i don't you know yeah. i mean yeah. how many families especially during the holidays that are coming the holidays are coming up and people are going to get to be together again yeah. what crazy drama is about to unfold and you, that's that's organic. You don't have to fake, you know, anything. So I just pay, I'm inspired by it. And I pay very close attention to those types of things. And if I don't use it in the book now, you know, 15 years from now, I'll find that story that makes it fit and it's right. Yeah. 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 Well, and I should have started out. So, so these toxic things is about Mickey Lambert, who works for a company where they basically create digital memories for people. And yeah. She, and she ends up at a um, an antique store and she's cataloging things and it a mystery unfolds as it dovetails with a serial killer. And that's another thing I love about your books because if you are in the mood for a serial killer thriller, here's a good book. If you want an Agatha Christie level plotting, here's a good book. If you want to read about family relationships, this book, like the mother daughter relationship is what stuck with me. That for me, I loved it all, but for me, that's what I still think about. Can I read you my favorite passage? Oh, I would love my that. My favorite part that I, I wrote and it, it's exactly that because while I love crime and all that. I loved writing the story of Mickey and her mother, Corey, and I'd like to read some for you. I would love that, yeah. Okay. And I've crossed out some, some revealing language, so there are no spoiler alerts. Um, so here we go. True love is waiting in my apartment. Mom has changed the sheets on my bed and she's opened a bottle of our favorite red wine and popped popcorn. I can see butter glistening on kernels from where I stand. I shower, scrubbing hard enough, even though all of me, inside and out, feels brittle. Mom has bought me one of her fluffiest towels and creamiest lavender lotions. Cleaned and scented, I trudged back to the living room. Mom, sitting on my couch, waits for me. Wanna talk? I'm wearing her print sweatshirt and ancient Lululemon leg leggings. She's wearing my Dwight Schrute office hoodie and track pants, both of which I thought I'd left at that condo, her ex-boyfriend's, on Miracle Mile. I grab one of the wine glasses and sit beside her. No, I don't. I take a sip and the wine warms my throat. Not right now. I grab the remote control from the coffee table. She watches as I scroll through Hulu's menu to find the Golden Girls. She plucks a second wine glass from the table and takes a long gulp. 
There's a small cocoa colored birthmark on the white of her right middle finger. I have the same mole on the same finger. Together we eat popcorn and watch Dorothy Rose and Blanche compete against each other in a dance marathon. I lay my head on her shoulder. She strokes my hair. Her love is like a cashmere blanket. Her love is like this wine. Her love is like the sun. She is my mother. There's this guy, I say, now that the wine has untangled my nerves. She says, mm-hmm. His name is Dexter and this memory bank I'm working on, it was for his mother, the store owner who died. Yeah, I really like him, but, but I'm not sure if he's good. I'm not sure if he's safe. Not sure he's safe because he's dangerous. Not sure he's safe because someone wants to harm him or because he wants to harm you. I look up, up, I look up at her. I don't know. My judgment, it's broken right now. I see murderers and dead people everywhere. She's the one who taught me that saying, my bad, and I'm sorry, the fuse is a sticky situation. That living single came before friends, that cheap shoes will give you bunions, and that wine spritzers are the devil's folly. And now she says, you've known him for what, three weeks? Which means that you don't know him or what he considers normal. He grew up around other people's things, had a mother who traveled the country digging through boxes in strangers' front yards. And you? She pokes my nose and forehead with her finger. You've been kept in a safe environment for 22 years and you've never lived more than 10 miles away. Your upbringing has also been weird, which means that anything unlike that can seem dangerous. So what do I do? Pay attention. If you see something off, take it at face value and don't try to explain it away. You have a gut. I know you do because I helped build it. Listen to it. If it's saying do to shady, then do to shady. We polish off the bottle of wine and the bowl of popcorn. As for Christopher, her ex-boyfriend, he may be fine as hell, but he was a shitty boyfriend. I never liked his ass. I cackle, you're extreme. Did he ever write you a bad poem? I make a face, no. Did he ever mess up his hair or his shoes to get something you dropped in the trash or in a fountain? I shake my head. He ever bring you a cool towel while you're sick and on the toilet? Oh, no, never. But then I wouldn't want him to see me being human? She smirks. Be wary of a man who you don't want bringing you a cool towel when you're about to pass out from explosive diarrhea. <laughs> her, obsession, her, her observations peck at me and I understand her point. Yeah. She kisses my forehead and stands. I take her hand and electricity from her touch settles me. Can you sleep back here with me? She smiles, musses my already must hair. Of course, I'll go get my supplies. The house gun, the hunting knife she keeps beneath the mattress and her charger because she, my mother, will face down the devil to protect me. And tonight I need that kind of comfort. Oh my God, I love that scene so much. I love that you chose that too because I, I that was one of my favorite scenes in the book. Yeah, and that scene, this book is like highly personal for me. And I said this earlier um, that this is the first story I didn't center myself as a 51 year old mother. It's a 24 year old character. Um, I haven't been 24 in several years. And so I saw Mickey as my daughter, Maya, and my eldest niece, Jordan, who are both young and vivacious and smart and protected in some ways. And it, I wrote it as a mother and I look at my daughter and, you know, we watch Golden Girls together. And though she's a minor, I, could, I see myself drinking wine with her and eating popcorn, which is our favorite snack. And I am already worried about her. You know, you're, you're, you're a parent. And no matter how much you teach your kid to be careful and to look over their shoulder, you know there's a world out there and there are people out there who want to see them uh, to harm them. And so when I wrote this book, I wanted to share uh, how I see motherhood and how I see my daughter and how, you know, even as adults, you can still be a mama bear who wants to, who will freaking burn someone up over your, your kid. So it was, I, I love writing that and projecting and thinking about my relationship with my daughter in the future. Yeah. And the fact that you nailed it so well makes it um, resonant 
the things that come later. And I, obviously I can't give anything away, but it really yeah. makes the, uh, one of the twists very impactful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what I mean by, you know, wanting to earn that twist. Yeah. <laughs> because that relationship means so much to me as a writer, when that twist happens, it's in some ways heartbreaking because it's like, well, what does all this other stuff mean? And it's sometimes it, it means nothing. It, we are all um, collections of different things, kind of like how the, the 12 things that, you know, Mickey is curating for Nadia Denham, the store owner, they seem disparate, they seem random. That's who we are as people. We take a little from here, a little from there, borrow this from a great aunt who you've never met, and you become who this who you are. And that's another reason why I wanted to, you know, write this story because we're all composed of memory and good intentions and some toxicity and bad mojo. We're all mixed up and used and you know passed from one owner and one user to the next and so yeah. 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 You know, so you can call bullshit on this, but I think most writers have a theme that they keep returning to, no matter the book, no matter the genre. Um, for me, it's it's the poison of secrets and specifically mm. family secrets. And mm -hmm. boy, is there a lot of stuff to dig at there. Um, but, <laughs> but I, in your books, I see, and I might be off on this, but I see a the one theme that consistently emerges is the balance between becoming independent in your own person, but also staying part of a community or a family. And it's like a push pull that creates a lot of um, powerful electricity in the book, right? Because because we understand wanting to be part of something, but also wanting to be our own person. Right. And how can you do either well when one one community demands something from you than another does? And that's why, I mean, that's the whole thing of memory too. It's like, oh yeah, I remember going to that parade. It's like, oh God, that's when, you know, there was a shooting and we're running and I, you know, that hot dog that I ate was awful or family, you know, it's, 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 it's all a mess. It's all a mess. And I am frustrated and excited by the mess um, of say, not saying things that bother you, but doing things out of obligation because you're supposed to, you know, in all relationships. So I, yeah, it's, it's weird. I do keep coming back to that. What is old and what is expected and how, despite your efforts to break out of it, you really can't and it brings you back home. What, if it's your personal home or it's your city or anything. I mean, we've all, with this pandemic, we've all been stuck home with whoever in whichever city, whichever state that you thought, you know, you could handle because, you know, I don't see people anyway. And here you are stuck with that. Yeah. 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 Unless you get yourself a husband and then you're not stuck. With <laughs> longer. So these toxic things just, it just came out yesterday. This book just yes. came out yesterday. It is a bestseller already. You got yes. the most amazing NPR uh, review of it today. Was it today? Yes, it was today. It was today. And as someone who wakes up at 440 every morning to write and sometimes wonders, am I, is this worth it? Meaning, is anyone even reading my stuff? It, it, why, why am I doing this? Um, it made me feel incredible because the reviewer got everything that I was trying to get across with this book. So for at least the next 24 hours, I'm buoyed by it. <laughs> yeah. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Check me out by like Sunday, then I'll be like, no, no. Maybe I should take up like pottery. <laughs> See, this is, we have to buy everybody buy three copies of this. <laughs> it doesn't take up pottery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so close. I, I like two years ago. I bought a sewing machine. It was like, well, I'm gonna find something. Yeah, yeah I kind of sucked at that too. So. Yeah. Yeah, I picked up cross stitch to do subversive cross stitching, and I yeah. didn't have the attention span for that. Freaking <laughs> writing, it just keeps calling me back. It, it, it's like I wish I could add, so maybe I could do something else. But I only write. <laughs> I only write, and so here I am. 
Well, yeah. and you've, you've put in your time. I, when I was doing some research, your first book came out in 2002. September 11th, 2002, the no. first anniversary of 9-11, yeah. You wanna yeah. talk about that book? Do you wanna? It was, you know, initially it was wonderful. Um, I had a really wonderful agent, Wendy Sherman, and an awesome editor at Scribner, um, Sharice Davis. And they were so kind and excited. And I had a big five contract and then, yeah. you know, the market was weird anyway for my voice. I initially had trouble um, trying to sell the novel. It was called, uh, it's a quiet thing, uh, no, a quiet storm. And it was about an African-American family in Los Angeles who were dealing with um, mental illness. And I got great reviews. I was a Borders original voice. Remember Borders from back in the day? Yeah. It was incredible, but you know, trying to launch a, a small book about a black family in Los Angeles on the first anniversary of 9-11, which has nothing to do with, you know, terrorism. That was hard. And then, you know, it was a time when, you know, urban fiction was a huge thing. Sister Soldier and those kind of very gritty East Coast types, black stories were what publishers were buying. And that was not what I was writing. And it was very difficult for me to get a, another book contract after that. Um, but I kept writing because stupid writing, I love it so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I kept writing and I produced two small, um, two self-published books. And this was right when Amazon Kindle came out mm -hmm. and I uploaded it and I was getting closer and closer to what I loved. And that was writing um, crime, uh, a quiet storm of psychological suspense. And even then they're like, well, you, you tell a mystery story, but it's literary fiction. Mm -hmm. You're kind of all over the place. And it's like, yeah, I know. And, you know, when you were saying if you like an Agatha Christie, Christie story, if you want, you know, a serial killer story, that's always kind of been my, my thing, uh, not sticking to one specific genre to either my, you know, benefit or not. Um, but eventually, you know, I found Norton. Um, some other life circumstances got me there, but it was that deciding that I want to write the, these types of stories before I leave the earth. And now here I am with a story that I absolutely love with um, a publisher who truly, really, you know, they're very excited about it and they're doing incredible support for it. And again, I just hope it just not just be over the moon so that I can, you know, buy fancy cheese and put my daughter through college next year. <laughs> <laughs> and so we can get more books, right? I mean, yes, that too. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Keep me getting up at 440 in the morning, y'all. Yeah. Cause you're, you have a full-time job in addition to being a mom, a wife and writing these yeah. books. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's like a demanding job. I write, um, fun I'm a fundraising writer for a major medical center out here in Los Angeles. And it's one of those big medical centers that saw a lot of COVID patients that they do a lot of research. And my job, starting from that Friday of left coast crime last year, March 13th, when it was canceled, I drove from San Diego straight to Beverly Hills to my job and started writing COVID-19 communications from proposals to letters to e-blast and all the rest of it. And it's, you know, been nonstop since then at home. And up until this point, I was very happy of, you know, keeping my novel writing life separate from my day writing life. But with everyone being sent home, it all like smashed in together. And I found myself, you know, really, really exhausted and missing my commute time, which was a great liminal space to think about, you know, writing and and how to solve a problem with your characters. I missed that. And, you know, I was very tired and confused with everything going on. Here I am explaining COVID-19 and I don't even know what it is. And I have a 16 year old daughter who's going through her own thing and, you know, aging parents. And it was all this big, crazy mess. And, you know, one of the great things as I was writing um, this story, 
I got to share the process with my daughter who helped me. I had her transcribe. I write everything longhand. Um, I, she helped me transcribe some of the stuff. She helped me with edits. She, you know, played a big part in bringing this book alive. And that's why I see Mickey and Corey so close because that's how I see my daughter. She helped write my pandemic book either by, you know, actively, you know, putting words on the page or just, being there and telling me about what young people do because I'm old and back in the day we didn't drink white claws you know we drank Mickey's hard lemonade and I don't know some of these things and how they talk so she was like my youth ambassador yeah. so it's been exhausting and now the only way I kind of separate my work life from my writing life is uh the pens I use That's, <laughs> I have a set of gel pins that are kind of crappy that I use for work and my nice stuff I save for, for my own stuff. And, you know, I used to, I didn't always get up at 440 to write, but now that I'm home, I, that's what I do just so that I can have that, a, a bigger break away um, in separation between my, my, my two lives. But I must say that writing um, for work keeps my writing muscle up. It keeps me from saying, I don't know what to write because my job, they don't care if I have writer's block. They need a letter because somebody died and this condolence letter needs to go out now. I don't get that luxury. So having that kind of write on demand muscle yeah. helps me with getting up every morning and putting something on the page and knowing that I can always come back and make it better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. And That's also, cool. you know, having that day job, I don't have to worry about eating, you know, my, 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 I, like I know that. that I'm going to get paid every other week. So that, you know, that helps take some of the pressure off of being creative. Yeah. 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 You know, somebody, I posted a Twitter for questions for you and Christina Estes on Twitter said, does Rachel still write longhand? So you write every book first draft longhand? Yes. Yes. I absolutely oh, love Lord. it. I do. Oh, well, part of it is, you know, <laughs> I'm at that age. Yeah, that's how we learned. And that's how I learn. And that's how I connect with what I'm writing. And I can cross out and write in the margins and all around the pages and stick post-it notes. And I don't have to look at the little squiggly green line or the squiggly red line and make corrections. And also, you know, I can just shove my legal pad in my purse. So when I go to soccer practice, I can whip it out. And I like I like office supplies, y'all. I do too. Nerd out about them. Yeah. yeah, I have a whole cabinet back there with my pens and notepads, and I try out different types of notepads. So yeah, I still write things longhand, out hard edits on paper, and probably I say the fifth or sixth draft, I'm on the computer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that makes a difference, right? Because it's very tactile. And so the writing yeah. comes through is just very strong. Yeah, 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 I, I like it, I like it. Yeah, well, you're, yeah, when you're talking about using the nice pens, you're, you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference. There we know, right? And so you're 51, yeah? Yes. Uh -huh. And I am, I am 51, we have the same agent, yeah. now we have the same editor and the same acquisitions editor, right? Yes. We are meant to be together. Yes, we should tour together. Yes, I love that. I love that. Yeah, and yeah. So how is your, so we're both at Thomas and Mercer right now. How has your yes. experience been? It has been amazing. Um, I have, uh, one of the best things about being with Thomas and Mercer is the, the use of a developmental editor. I had never had one before. And mine is Clarence Hayes. And he is so smart and so talented. And he asks questions that it's like, Duh, why didn't I think of that? And he just brings out the best in me. And Jessica Tribble, who's my acquisitions agent, she's just a, a editor. She's just incredibly supportive and will answer any question I have. It makes me think about things differently. And, you know, it, everyone's been so supportive and so open to these weird tricks that I want to do which is important to me. They get me. And I, you know, I, I, I do miss, you know, my, my people at Forge. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Alexis. And they, 
were incredible. But I, I knew that it was time for me to look, you know, look elsewhere too, because, you know, as, as writers, everything is so personal. And while it's, you know, so personal, we forget sometimes that it is, you know, a business. That's and true. I had to make, you know, some decisions. And it was so hard for me because part of my my problem, yeah, and it's a problem sometimes, I'm so freaking loyal. I will lose, I used a camera once that my um, older brother gave me for a birthday. And that camera, I used it like for 10 years and it was dying. And I'd have to keep pushing the button, but it's like, I don't want to get rid of it because my brother gave it to me, which is, you know, part of why I wanted to write these toxic things that holding on to things because they have some meaning and, and, and just, yeah, I wanted to incorporate, that's how I feel about some things. And I feel that way about relationships. And in my day job as a fundraiser, um, that's how you get those million dollar gifts by relationships. People just don't give $30 million to people they don't know. They give $30 million to someone who means something, to, to programs that mean things. And, you know, Forge had poured a lot into me. So it, it was very difficult for me to say, not this time. But I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunities that they gave me and helping me, you know, figure out what it was that I wanted to write. And, you know, you never burn bridges and I'm still, you know, I, I love them people. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to, you know, writing more stories with Thomas and Mercer too. Yeah. I'm so yeah. glad that the world has finally caught up to what you're doing, right? With the different, the different layers, the different voices. Yeah. It, it's, you know, for, we've, we've been writing now for a very long time, you and I, yeah. and you just, you just want editors to trust you yeah. um, to, to say, okay, this looks really kind of twisty and crazy on this treatment here that you gave me, but you've kind of landed that, you know, other times. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, yes, I'll take that story yeah. and do it. And, and, and so I'm happy that Thomas and Mercer, that Jessica said, okay, yeah, this, this thing about memory banks and, you want illustrations and what's this relationship and what's that over there? Yeah. Okay, I kind of dig that. So yeah, so I, I'm 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 grateful. I'm yeah. grateful for that. Yeah. And it's out there in the world, and I think your days of small crowds are over. <laughs> right, your star is, is on the rise. I hope so. Yeah, it's been a very long journey since September 11th, 2002. Two, yeah. <laughs> right, almost 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, you know, some people may look at me and say, oh, you're getting all this attention just now. And it's like, I, I've been on this road for a very long time, a very long time, 20 years. And it is finally nice to, you know, see banners on websites with my book, to see e-blasts like the Publishers Weekly e-blast this morning with my book there. It feels, it feels great. It feels great. So, yeah. and you yeah. earned, you earned it. I mean, that it makes a difference, right? You put your time yeah. in, you earned this. I I put a lot of time. <laughs> I, put a lot of time <laughs> okay. I will not shy away from that. I I mean, if we're talking about hard work. I yes, I I work my ass off. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 glad that you know people are picking it up and are loving it and it's resonating yeah. with a lot of people. Yeah. So enough of the hard work. Do you want to have some fun? I have 20 questions for you. Ooh, yes. And they're, they're rapid fire, so you can't okay. overthink these. You ready? Okay. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. And I don't know what she's about to ask you. Yeah, you don't. No. I'm so glad you trust me. Yes. <laughs> if you could choose one song to play every time you walked into a room for the rest of your life, what song would you choose? Oh, I do this all the time. Um, crazy in Love, only because... Beyonce did that homecoming documentary and yeah. she comes into it and she's walking with a cane and a, like a Pharaoh's hat. Yeah. And I said to my daughter, I'm like, I want to walk into an event or a room like that every time, not with necessarily with a cane, but like with that kind of attitude. So yeah. anything with Beyonce that like, it just makes me kind of like swag. It's like, yeah, I'm shit. <laughs> You're lucky I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> Okay, number two, favorite fast food restaurant and favorite item there? 
Um, favorite fast food restaurant. Yeah. See, that's hard because my favorite food is tacos, but okay. there are no fast food. I will say McDonald's. Okay. I will say McDonald's only because their fries are jamming. They bought back high C orange. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I will get the, the double cheeseburger meal with the French fries and the high C orange. And that's like my go-to. I actually, my husband asked, since I'm, you know, doing this and I'm not going to cook after this, he's like, what do you want to eat? I'm like, McDonald's is down the street. I am not ashamed. Yeah. I love McDonald's. Yeah. So you don't have Taco Bell? You, you must have Taco Bell. I can't do Taco Bell yeah, anymore. Fair. It's that's not fair. nice. No. My husband and I, we, about <laughs> five years ago, we're like, let's do a let's do a Del Taco run, like late at night on a Saturday night. And we like got like the 600 tacos for 49 cents or whatever. It was not a good, it was not good the next day. Yeah. I've never sweat so much in my life. Which is probably why I said the, the line about, you know, don't be with someone who doesn't bring you a, 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 a cold towel. When you're shivering you know. over the toilet. <laughs> I know firsthand. I know firsthand. I know which I speak. <laughs> okay. Number three, what is your favorite TV show and why is it The Golden Girls? <laughs> you know me. You know me. Yes, The Golden Girls is absolutely my favorite show and I watch it every night before I go to bed. Um, it's so clever. The writing is so clever. And every woman is, you know, they, you first see them as these tropes, like the crabby one, the old one, the sexy one, the ditzy one, but they all are so much more than that. And it's part of the performance, but it's also the writers who are giving them great lines and great things to say. So yeah, I love that show. And I, if Hulu ever takes it off of streaming, I have all you know seven seasons on DVD, and I will break out my DVD player and put them in because yeah, it, it, it is the Golden Girls. I have socks. I have knee length socks with their faces on. <laughs> that's that's how deep it is for me. <laughs> I think you should be proud, and you are. You're proud. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and when I first learned that about you a few years ago, I went, went back and started rewatching, and it is you're absolutely right. Because mm -hmm. I saw when I when it came out, and I was sort of a formless. We were kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. but no, yeah, but now it's like fifty. Okay, I can see that because fifty is when you don't give any fucks at all. Yeah. Like, this is who I am. This is how much I weigh. You know, I have my grades coming in. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah, I appreciate it the older I get. And, you know, I've indoctrinated my daughter who watches it with me. And, you know, she watches Friends, which I can't. I've watched maybe 10 minutes of Friends. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But Golden Girls were like that. Yeah. 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 Cheers. Yeah. OK. What part of the human face or body is your favorite? Like, are you I love eyes. I love eyes. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be like some random shade, just really nice almond shaped eyes that are clear and kind and warm. And I had to pull back because I was always writing about someone's eyes in like all my books. And it's like, oh my God, me and eyes. But I like eyes and the close second are teeth. Hmm. I like really nice smiles. Okay. And not necessarily the fake veneer type, but just nice, nice natural, Crooked, straight, you know, I like, I like that too, but eyes, I love eyes. Well, and that, and you sort of hinted at my next question, which is what are your crutch words? Because in my book, everybody like shrugs and nods. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> chuckle, chuckle and sigh, because I, <laughs> that's all I do all day. I chuckle and sigh, yeah. chuckle, sigh and shake my head, chuckle, sigh, shake my head, so, yeah, <laughs> those things. And I have to go through and do a search and kill some of those chuckles and write, you know, giggle instead of chuckle. But yeah, those are my three words. Yeah, do you ever do you ever go so far as to guffaw? <laughs> Why? Well, I haven't guffawed yet. <laughs> I think I used guffaw or I tried to and it just, you gotta have the right scene for a guffaw. Actually, I did use guffaw once. I remember and it was, I was being, um, it was in They All Fall Down. I used guffaw and I used concatenated 
because the person I was writing about, Frank, who's this kind of stuffy black guy on the island with Marion Macy, he used those $10 words. Mm -hmm. So I used that $10 word, you know, against him. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and to refer back to Agatha Christie, from earlier, um, that book is fantastic for Thank Agatha you. fans. Thank yeah, you. Well, they all fall down. Yeah, they all fall down, and they and people should buy all of them from from the bookstore, right? Yes, please. Murder, 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 murder by the by book. book. Yes. Okay, quicksand or lava? Which one is scarier? Quicksand, because we grew up with the whole quicksand and the Bermuda Triangle yes. and spontaneous combustion. All right. those scared me. But it just yes. the grease spot on the floor. I, yeah. And lockjaw. Lockjaw was also scary because if you put a metal can in the refrigerator, like peaches, canned peaches, and there's something in it and you get lockjaw. Yeah. So I didn't have that. Was it botulism? This botch we might have some shaky science from our childhood that we have to explore. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, between you know, all the quicksand in Los Angeles. <laughs> In the ghetto, you know, I don't know. Could be anywhere. Could be anywhere. And you're just trying to get away and then you spontaneously combust. Exactly. Exactly. And then disappear into the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. That is a classic one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite beer? I don't think of you as a beer. Drink. I don't drink beer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. I wish I did sometimes. Yeah. But I like wine. Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. We yeah. should get that later. Yeah. Okay, so let's say it's a zombie apocalypse, which I think is not too far in the future. What skill do you bring to the camp? I will, I bring, I, I am a forward thinker. I, since I'm a plotter, Manner. I can pretty much figure out what everyone's going to react to and what those, not necessarily the zombies, but yeah. how the, the survivors are going to act. So I can get my little group together that I like and we can like escape or plan against those people and their motivations because that's what I do. Sweet, you are yeah. in, yeah. You are mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. uh, describe your driving style. I am, a, a, again, looking and, and, and planning ahead. I am very much a defensive driver and I know what people are gonna do before they even figure it out. And it's like, yep, they just made a left turn right from the way on the right lane and yeah. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very careful. And now that I know my daughter's watching because she's driving, you know, I, 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 I try and only go like five miles over the speed limit instead of, you know, the 20. Isn't that terrible when they first learn to drive and they use all the rules that we forgot? Yeah, it's like, yeah. why are your hands, both hands on the steering wheel? Oh, that's right. <laughs> three and nine. <laughs> it's 10 and three in Minnesota. In a, oh, <laughs> What is your favorite candy? Mm, I love Twix. Oh, I yeah. love Twix. And you remember when Twix first came out? It was like revolutionary. Who would have thought cookies and caramel and chocolate with two sticks? What the <laughs> it was a treasure in a bag. <laughs> yes, yes. It's like, ooh, I'm going to take all the Twix. We fight over the Twix. And then second place was Snickers. Yeah. And Snickers was my mom's favorite, my, my dad. Um, growing up, he, on his way to, uh, from work to coming home, he'd stop at the liquor store, one, to get him something to drink, but also he'd get us Hostess fruit pies. Lemon was my favorite. He'd bring my mom like three Snickers. And that was ev almost every day when he uh, got to come home. So, yeah. But then Snick Twix came out and that changed the game. Oh, that changed the game. Yeah. <laughs> What's your yeah. least favorite candy? Like a circus peanuts, corn nuts sort of. Oh circus. God, circus peanuts. Yes, candy corn. Yes, um, black licorice. Oh, yeah. That. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah lic I, licorice is a lie. Just like raisins and cookies, yeah. it's a lie. Like, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. What if you had to live somewhere other than L.A.? Where would it be? Kauai. Oh. I absolutely. We visited once um, that island. And it was the first time that I actually relaxed and slowed down, partly because the speed limit is 25 miles per hour and there are literally chickens crossing the road. <laughs> but it was so quiet and so beautiful. And we always talk about retiring there, um, keeping our house in L.A. because you don't sell 
uh, real estate in Los Angeles and California, but having a place there where I can actually disconnect, you know, I love that place. Yeah. I love that you had an answer ready for that. Yeah. I was just talking about it with another soccer parent. We were talking about our, you know, as we're moseying closer and closer to retirement, whatever that means, even though social security is about to like run out in a few years, but in the event that we actually do, you know, yeah, that place. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Can I visit? Can I come visit? Yes, you yes. can. Oh, oh, good. You can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one more speed question and then John will come back on and maybe have questions from other people. If not, I've got mm -hmm. so many other things I want to talk to you about. But okay. my last question, what actor could you see playing Lou? And how about Mickey? What actor do you see playing Mickey? Um, for Lou, it was always Noemi Harris who played, um, oh my gosh, uh, she was the she was in Doctor Who. She's a British actress. She was in 27 Days Later. Okay. Um, she was in some other film, the cop, a cop film like two years ago. So it was always her in my mind. Okay. And um, for Mickey, that's my dog panting. Oh. <laughs> for Mickey, it was, um, her name is, oh, Aja. No, it wasn't Aja. She played, she was the actress in Miss, oh, hell, Miss Congenial. Juneteenth. She was the mom in Miss Juneteenth. Um, I can't remember her name. Oh, she was in Sleepy Hollow. Uh, uh, not Sleepy Hollow, but um, The Headless Horseman on Fox. Yeah. Uh, I never watched, but I know what you mean. Yeah, her. <laughs> and Corey was Carrie Washington. They have like this similar kind of, of, of look. But I'm open to any actress who is interested. In <laughs> Even Zendaya, Zendaya. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah, she's on fire right now. Yeah. Her career for well for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think those are good choices. John is back to you. Are there questions that other people would like to ask? There are, but before we get into those, yes, you've been so great to, to lead the conversation for us tonight. And you have a book coming out in October. Litany, can you Yay. tell us about that? Yeah. You know, thank you for asking. Uh, so Litany is a, inspired by a true crime. Uh, in the 19, in 1983, mid-1980s, there was the satanic panic sweeping the United <laughs> States. And there was in Jordan, Minnesota, a town population less than 3,000 um, had their own satanic panic um, case, and it and it blew up across the globe, and then it sort of gotten written off in history as um, you know people overreacting, people just this hysteria, um, and it turned out that there was a lot more to it, and so I. Uh, my book has a 14 year old protagonist. She has to move from California to this small Minnesota town and she's up against sort of this adult world of looking away from uh, something terrible that's really happening, but the whole world is trying to write it off. I loved it. Oh, thank you. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Creepy. So for everybody who's watching, we've got that, it's, we've got it on the event page. That's Litany and it comes out October 19th. Sorry, my cat just grabbed the, the cord for my ring light and almost pulled my leg. <laughs> <laughs> my cats were running around and Rachel's dog was doing some scritchy thing. It's like mutual of Omaha on this. <laughs> you just need to give, pull up Merle Perkins. From Marlon Perkins, yeah. Merle, yeah. Yeah, and get a Zima and we've got a good uh -huh. night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Rachel, Christina wants to know where did the title come from and, and how, when in the process did you decide the title for the book? Um, it came, the original title was All These Beautiful Things. And then it's like, oh, that's kind of long. And also the store was called Beautiful Things. And so it was kind of too on the nose. And then I started thinking about memories and family and toxic and toxic relationships. And that's, I shortened it to these toxic things. And that could be the things that Mickey is curating. That could be the people in the book. That could be relationships. It just covered so much. So it stayed. So how did you decide what those things that she's curating were? Um, I went to Pinterest and Etsy in just random places. And said, well, what would people, co you know, collect that seems so safe and undramatic? 
um, like I'm looking now, it's like, oh, this pen, it could be just a pen to you, but you know, I signed my first book with this pen. So little things that seem to have no meaning, but you know, someone collects. So I, they're kind of just random things. And it was, a, you know, I wanted to challenge myself to take something that seems as, you know, random as a hedgehog keychain and putting a story around that. That was one of those, you know, challenges that, you know, writers do sometimes. It's like, well, how can I make that interesting? How can I make that dangerous? How can I bring sadness to something as random as a hedgehog keychain? One of the things I thought was interesting too was all of the drawings of the items in the book. Can you talk about how that came to be? I wanted to do that trick that I learned like 15 years ago by having these little illustrations and the type of character that Mickey is, she is that type of girl who kind of just scribbles and jots things down. She's into stories. She's into, you know, the, the romance of this kind of curation thing. And I wanted to feature each item and I needed something to break up the text. So it's like, well, why not put down what she's actually scribbling? Because that's how we remember things. Well, for some of us, I remember things by writing. And so Mickey does too. And so this one's for both of you, but we'll let Jess start. Can you guys talk a little bit about the difference between writing a standalone and writing a series? Yeah, you know, I'm, I've just started doing standalones. Before that, I I just did series. And I always thought that standalones were, um, I don't know, kind of a waste of time because you build this world, you build these characters, and then you just walk away from them. Hmm. But now I've gone to the total other side of the camp because you have this energy and this um, creativity that you just pour into one book rather than stretching it out. Yeah. So for me, I just, anything that I think, well, I might, when I'm writing a series, I might use that in a later book. I put it all into that one book for a standalone. How about you, Rachel? Um, I'm like you in, in that way. I, I dreamed of doing like the Sue Grafton. I wanted to be the yeah, right. Sue Grafton. But then there's so many different stories I want to tell. And Lou can't tell this story about these toxic things. She'd be, you know, trying to solve it as a cop, not as a young woman who's trying to figure out who she is and who the people around her are. So the standalones, you get to people, you know, hop, you get to situation hop, you get to, you know, discover new parts of the city that I love. I love Los Angeles and there's so many stories around here and I want to get to them. You can't necessarily do that well with one character. So my disclaimer here is you're not allowed to say each other's books because we've established that you guys have both read each other's books and love them. What is something that you've read lately that you loved? Let's start with Jess. Oh, uh, Megan Abbott's, the, is it The Turnout? I'm terrible uh -huh. at titles. Her, her book that just came out. Um, mm -hmm. The Turnout. The Turnout, yeah. I mean, it, it is such a treat when Megan Abbott, when a Megan Abbott book comes out and I just mm -hmm. sort of set aside a whole day to luxuriate in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for me, that's the one most recently, besides Rachel's book, that really stuck with me. And for me, um, Sean Cosby's newest, um, Razor Blade Tears. One, he's just, the language is gorgeous, and I, I'm, I'm a language slut. I like great turns of phrases and things that make me smile and break my heart. But I also like reading about a part of the world that I don't know. You know, I kind of know about Virginia. My, my people are from the South, but... I don't know how it is to live in a place like that. I tend to stay away from rednecks and that kind of thing. So what is this world that you're writing about, Sean? So I loved Razor Blade Tears as I loved Blacktop Wasteland because I get to learn some new things as a, you know, a city girl. Yeah. And we have um, we have signed copies of both of those in stock if anybody's watching and wants to check yeah. them out. And if you order them tonight, we're starting a 20% off signed book sale tomorrow, but we'll well, under the discount, if you order them tonight, I've dropped the links to both of those. They're both big, big uh, store favorites of ours as well. Uh, I felt so bad for Sean when we did his event for Razor Blade Tears. It was when one of the storms was blowing through his area. And so he could connect using his phone, but he couldn't use his camera. So Alex Segura interviewed him, but he was <laughs> through a blank screen because it was basically like a radio interview the whole time. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. They, they were both such troopers about it, but it was, it was, it was, it was, a dicey one tech wise. 
<laughs> hey, speaking of books that are that just came out, has anybody has either of you read Kelly Garrett's latest, like a sister? I'm dying to get my no, hands on it. It is really good. I read so and I'm sure it's even improved because I, I read an early draft of it and I, I am so excited for when it comes out next spring. I know you're gonna have Kelly on. You're you're a big fan too. And she's so talented and she has such an incredible voice. I, I always tell her. I know when I'm reading her. I, I, again, like language slut. I'm a, a voice slut too. So I, I like reading something. It's like, oh, she wrote that. Like Jess, when you write stuff, it's like, oh, I know Jess wrote that. Mm -hmm. Sean wrote. Oh, Sh and Kelly has that voice, and she's she's gonna. I mean, she's she's already very popular. Yeah. She's going to. She's gonna rule the the world one day. Yeah, Excellent. we're so excited. We saw that she's, you know, started to put together like the early, the early release copy packs that are sending out. And we're like, oh, we hope we're on the list. And actually, it was just oh, even, uh, her and Alex, uh, we are working with the Crime Writers of Color to try to set up a, yes. an every other month um, kind of reading series, kind of like we did uh, last week with their um, underrepresented writers panel. We're trying to set something up yes, like, like every awesome. other month. So we're super excited about that. So if you guys missed Thank that you for last week, definitely go check that out and keep an eye on the, the website because we should hopefully have some, we're in early talks now, but we should have some good news about that real soon. Too. Yes, exciting. Nice. Awesome. So we talked about um, Litany coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. Rachel, I know your new book just came out yesterday, but what do you have mm -hmm. coming up next? What are you working on? Because you know something is because I'm like a robot like that. Um, <laughs> We Lie Here comes out next summer sometime, and it's another family story. But in this one, um, a young woman comes home. Uh, she lives in Los Angeles, and she comes home to Palmdale, which is 100 miles north in the Mojave Desert of California, uh, to plan her parents' 20th anniversary um, party. And as she's doing that, a distant cousin comes to Palmdale to tell her something. But before her cousin can tell her that thing, she's found dead in a lake. And Yara, who's my heroine, has to figure out what the hell is going on. So that's a great family. title too. It, it's what I was thinking that title, did you come up with that title or did uh -huh. you? Yeah, it's a great title. Yes, it was actually Here We Lie. And Jessica's like, can we twist it to say We Lie Here? Say like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So I think that's going to do it for us for tonight. But before we wrap up, I saw somebody mention dang time zones. They missed the first hour. So if you missed the part, any part of the chat, uh, we've been chatting with Jess Lowry, whose new book Litany comes out on um, October 19th, and Rachel Housel Hall, whose newest book, These Toxic Things, just came out yesterday. Uh, once we're done, Facebook and YouTube will archive the chat so you'll be able to rewatch it if you missed any of it. And while you're there, we hope you'll definitely check out all the other great author events that we've had. Um, and since the pandemic started, there's a, there's a wealth of content there. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we've got copies of both authors' books uh, in the store, so you can visit us at murderbooks.com to order them. Jess, thank you so much for leading the discussion tonight. This has thank been wonderful. You, Jess. Yeah, it's my pl absolute pleasure. It's the best time I've had in a while. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> thank and Rachel, you. congratulations on the new book. Um, it's so good to see you again. And like you said, hopefully ne by next summer when the next one comes out, we'll actually get to do it in person. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you for hosting me and so Our many pleasure. writers. It really means so much to all thank of you. us. We're, thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we're happy to do it. It's, it's been nice to still be able to get to connect with the community this way too. So, mm -hmm. so you guys have a good evening and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rachel. See you Bye, soon. Jess.